Hi everyone, I'm Celeste. Welcome to my booktube channel. Happy to be here today. I took a week off last week to get some personal appointments and things done that needed to be done, but I'm back and uh, happy to be here. And so today I'm going to chat with you about all the things, all the stuff, all the merch madness that's going on in booktube land. There are so many different um, things going on that it mind-boggling it can be overwhelming and I'm not sure how many I'll actually get to but today is just sort of an excited sharing of a little pile of possibilities for a couple of them um, so there's Historathon, for example, which is a year-long challenge which I'm participating in. And the first quarter, which goes up until April, is focusing on the ancient world up to about 500 AD. So I'm uh, pressing on with that. Uh, more on that in a moment. And then there is also the Women's Prize for Nonfiction. It's, that's an inaugural award uh, this year. There's been the Women's Prize for Fiction for a number of years now, but they've just started the Women's Prize for Nonfiction, which is exciting for me. Um, one of the judges is, judges is one of my favorite historians, Susanna Lipscomb. So I'm very excited about that. Um, there's Midgrade March. There is March Mystery Madness. There is the Irish Readathon. Um, and then there are several of my own little challenges that I've just set for myself. So um, I have three of those. And uh, one is Book Voyage, which is to to basically just read more books from more countries um, and get out of my little bubble where I'm reading all sort of classics from England and the United States and getting my head out of that and reading more works from around the world. I'm also trying to read more uh, modern works. Um, yeah, and that may be a whole separate video. I have a lot to say about that. Um, then there is also my personal journeys reading through Newbery Award winners and runner-ups, and also uh, Pulitzer Prize winners and runner-ups. So there's that. Um, so we've got a lot to go through. Let me start out, though, by um, sharing that I did last week read this book. This is by Mary Stewart. It's Thunder on the Right. I so, so, so love these hotter editions. They're just beautiful. And um, I actually found out that this set of Mary Stewart books with these covers, these are all taken from vintage travel posters, which I hadn't realized. And if you Google, where was it I saw it? I think it's Pinterest. If you Google like Pinterest Mary Stewart travel posters, you will see many of the original larger posters that these details were taken from and used for as covers of the hotter editions. So um, yeah, I read this. I was looking for just a fun, entertaining read. I liked this. Was it the best Mary Stewart novel I've read so far? No, um, it was okay. It was fun. It was entertaining. I did feel like she went a little overboard with the flowery and descriptive language. Now, she's a master of that. She's very poetic. She's very evocative. She is known for her paragraph-long descriptions of rainstorms and sunsets and, you know, shadows on mountainsides and all of that kind of thing. And I usually love them. This time around, it just kind of, uh, I was feeling impatient with it and I found myself skipping over them rather than becoming saturated with them and really immersing myself in them and enjoying them. Um, I'll just read you the premise of the book. Okay. High in the rugged Pyrenees lies the Valley of the Storms, where a tiny convent clings to the beautiful but lonely mountainside. Jenny Silver arrives seeking her missing cousin. 
um, and is devastated when she learns of Jillian's death following a terrible car accident. But Jenny's suspicions are aroused when she's told the blue flowers ornamenting her cousin's grave were Jillian's favorite. Jenny knows Jillian was colorblind, and so starts her mission to uncover what really happened to her. Now, I will say she gets an A plus for her descriptions of a sinister nun. Um, at this convent in the mountains. Um, so that part's really cool. But I just felt the romance was a little flat and the, again, it was a little too overboard in terms of the romantic descriptions of uh, the, the flora and flauna, fauna and scenery and all of that. But it was good. You know, you can't go too far wrong with Mary Stewart. I would give this one, you know, like a three-ish. Uh, so yeah. Thunder on the right. Okay, so um, there is a challenge in the month of March, and it is a bookish tribute to International Women's Day. It's being hosted by a bunch of good booktubers. I will link their videos and the announcements and all of that down below. Um, it's called Fierce Reads, a bookish tribute to International Women's Day. So there are a number of challenges for this. And so I do have some books, which I was going to read in March anyway. And so why not do the challenge since I have books for all of them or most of them. Um, so the first one is pick a book by a fierce female author. And this kind of coincides with my historathon reading. Um, so I am reading this tiny little book. Um, this is a library edition, but I'll hold it up for you. It's Women and Power by Mary Beard. And uh, this is just a little essay, but it is so worth reading. Um, and Mary Beard, of course, is um, the uh, Roman historian. And so this is like a little essay, which is very fierce, very brave, um, and talks about misogyny in history and in historic study. And she goes back as far as Homer's Odyssey and shows how women have been prohibited from leadership roles in civic life, public speech, um, historically being defined as inherently male. And she goes into detail about Odysseus's wife, Penelope, who is uh, silenced by Odysseus's son, Telemachus, um, and her son, by the way. So she's silenced by her son and sent upstairs and told to be quiet. And she goes on from there. But the whole essay um, gives numerous examples of this happening throughout history and the importance of women's voices. And since March is Women's History Month, but I just felt that this would be a really uh, good, uh, easy to find, easy to complete um, title for some of the challenges for this month, celebrating strong women. Okay, and the next prompt is, choose a book with a strong female protagonist. So I have been reading and utterly, utterly loving so far, The Fox Wife by Yang Shi Chu. And again, this is from the library, but let me tell you, normally I prefer reading a novel to listening to it on Audible. This is an exception. I am so enjoying listening to the author narrate her novel. It somehow just brings it to life in a way that most um, audio does not for me. This is like um, someone with a marvelous, crisp, clear voice enchanting you and reading a fairy tale out loud. So I've been enjoying several chapters a day as I walk around our neighborhood and we still have some snow on the ground, so it's perfect. Um, I'm only 14 chapters in so far, so I can't vouch that it's going to be wonderful all the way through or that I'll love the ending or anything like that. 
but so far it's just really really cinematic um i'm trying to think of how i can describe this to you think of if you've ever seen uh the movie crouching tiger hidden dragon think of the woman from that um, as kind of a shape-shifting female detective um, or as a like a female version of Harrison Ford's character in Blade Runner um, but in the early 1900s in Manchuria at the end of the crumbling empire um, and I'm talking about the end of the Qing Dynasty with all of its restaurants and alleyways and intrigues and secret police and the opium wars. And um, th there's also in the background sort of the falling of the empire um, and Empress um, Cao Xi, who she's the last dowager empress of China, and she was said to be very ruthless and conniving. Um, so there's sort of intrigue going on, but that all just sort of forms a backdrop to the story of this woman here, and her name is Snow. And I will read you the description. It's going to sound very odd, but it kind of combines folklore with a little bit of a mystery um, and fairy tale. Okay, so Manchuria, 1908. In the last years of the dying Qing Empire, a courtesan is found frozen in a doorway. Her death is clouded by rumors of foxes, which are believed to lure people by transforming themselves into beautiful women and handsome men. Bao, a detective with an uncanny ability to sniff out the truth, is hired to uncover the dead woman's identity. Since childhood, Bao's been intrigued by the fox gods, yet they've remained tantalizingly out of reach, until perhaps now. Meanwhile, Snow is a creature of many secrets, but most of all, she's a mother seeking vengeance for her lost child. Hunting a murderer, she will follow the trail from northern China to Japan while Bao falls doggedly behind. Navigating the myths and misconception of fox spirits, both Snow and Bao will encounter old friends and new foes even as more death occurs. And so it's folklore and mystery and fairy tale all kind of brought together in this really fascinating book. And this just came out literally like last week. Um, and I, when I read the description of it, I absolutely jumped on it. So um, I'm shocked that I was able to find it at my library. But really, if you do decide to read it, try the audio, audible version because she, the author, Yang Si Chu, has just the most beautiful voice. It's just perfect for narrating this. Um, yeah, so there's that. And actually, one of the other questions in the Fierce Read Challenge is read a book based on a mythical character. So I know a lot of people are um, choosing like Son of Achilles and other Madeline Miller books and Greek mythology for that prompt, but I'm sticking with the Fox Wife because it also fulfills it. Um, yeah, so let's see. Highlight your favorite female character, Snow. Um, discover a book by an up and coming female author. So that I do not have a book for. So if any of you can uh, suggest any books by up and coming female authors that would help me for this challenge, please feel free to recommend them in the comments below. Always love finding new authors. Um, and then read a book that explores the bonds of female friendship. So I have a couple for this. And the first is another book that I've started reading. I'm about 50 pages into this one. And that is The Radium Girls, The Dark Story of America's Shining Women by Kate Moore. This is mind-boggling, mind-blowing, astounding. This is nonfiction, and um, it is, of course, the story of the 
women who painted uh, dials for clocks, uh, navigational equipment, uh, planes that were being used in World War One, etc. And um, unfortunately, what happened to them as a result of constant exposure with the radium um, and how they fought for justice. This isn't a new book by any means, but it's new to me and um, such an important story. And I first learned about their plight actually from a PBS documentary that I watched and I'll post the link to that down below. It is so worth watching if you're a history fan, um, if you're a fan of uh, medical history or forensic history, which I am. It's very strange, you know. I have a lot of phobias about um, uh, medical things um, where myself, where I'm concerned, but um, I'm fascinated with medical history somehow, the social history and everything. And there's a really good documentary uh, called The Poisoner's Handbook. And I will, I think it's from PBS, and I will post a link to that down below. It's really worth a watch. And it includes a section on the Radium Girls. So yeah, definitely that would be my choice for that prompt. And additionally, um, this was recommended to me, and this is the graphic novel version of the Radium Girls, and it's by C. Y. C. I don't know if it's Psy or C, um, but this is um, a graphic novel version of the story of the girls who, in 1918, in Orange, New Jersey. Um, were known as the Ghost Girls. Um, these women worked with this dial paint all day long. It got into their clothes, into their hair, into their skin. Um, and of course, they we all know they licked the tips of the brushes to do the dial painting, so it was on their teeth. Um, and uh, so they had this sort of ghostly glow about them all the time, which very sadly also meant they were being poisoned by the radium. This book is interesting because it has a kind of a glittery shine, which you probably can't see in this light, but um, maybe you can. But uh, it's on their faces and it's on the dials on the back of the book. But so this tells their story in a graphic novel form. So, um, yeah. So I thought that looked very interesting too, just to get sort of a different take on the story. Um, yeah. And then the other book that I've decided to read in the month of March for um, a challenge on women's friendships is The Women by Kristen Hanna. This is also brand spanking new. This came out a couple weeks ago as well. And um, yeah, this um, is also a book of the month club and it's gotten very high ratings so far. I know there are a few people on booktube who have had uh, different opinions. They haven't thought it was that good. Now, I have never really read a Kristen Hanna book before, and I don't really even know if it, she's my type of author, but I am interested in nurses in Vietnam. So what better time to at least try to read it or to learn about that topic through um, the portal of this book. Even if I end up not reading the book, I'm still going to learn about that subject. And um, uh, my, I also buy books for my mother-in-law, so this is one that we can share. I can pass this on to her when I am done reading it. And um, it's supposed to be one of the best Kristen Hanna books. And what I did do before I um, got this was I watched several booktubers who love Kristen Hanna and have tier ranked all of her books. And for all of them, this was actually in the top four of all the books, and she's got many, that Kristen Hanna has written. So I am going to give it a try. I do also have this one on Audible, so I could listen to it when I'm taking my walks, because um, it is kind of a big book, but I'm going to give it a try. So um, yeah, Kristen Hanna, The Women. And then let's see, are there any other 
things in this challenge. No, I think that's it. Um, okay, so Historathon, Fierce Reads. Then we have the Women's Prize for Nonfiction. And there are two books that I am interested in um, which have made it to the long list for that prize. Now, I am not reading those during the month of March. Um, I am going to read them when that time period comes up this year through Historathon, but I am going to get the books uh, this month. All That She Carried by Tia Miles, and that book is about an enslaved woman named Rose who in 1850s South Carolina faced a crisis, the imminent sale of her daughter Ashley. Thinking quickly, she packed a cotton bag with a few items. Soon after, the nine-year-old girl was separated from her mother and sold. Decades later, Ashley's granddaughter Ruth embroidered this family history on the sack in spare, haunting language. That in itself is a story, but it's not the whole story. How does one uncover the lives of people who in their day were considered property? So, um, you know I love the social history of clothing, textile, cloth, the provenance of objects, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, a purse used by Jane Austen or a glove, a ring, um, you know, a blazer worn by a woman in World War II. I love the provenance of clothing, particularly women's clothing. So this sounds right up my alley. And that is one of the finalists for the Women's Prize. And then additionally, there is a second book, which I'm also interested in reading later this year. And it is also a finalist for the Women's Prize. That is called Young Queens by Leah Redmond Chang. And it says, 16th century Europe, Renaissance masters paint the ceilings of Florentine churches, King's battle for control of the continent, and the Reformation forever changes the religious organization of society. Amidst it all, three young women come of age and into power in an era of empires and revolutions. Catherine de' Medici's story begins in a convent stormed by soldiers intent on seizing the key to power in Florence. Catherine herself was a girl barely 11 years old. Mary Queen of Scots' story begins in Scotland and ends in England. Elizabeth de Valois' story begins in France. Uh, it ends tragically in Spain as a cherished queen consort and mother, one who must make the ultimate sacrifice for her kingdom. So now here's the really interesting part, is their intersection. Catherine, Mary, and Elizabeth lived at the French court together for many years before scattering to different kingdoms. These years bound them to one another through blood and marriage, alliance and friendship, loved and filial love and filial piety, bonds that were tested when the women were forced to part and take on new roles. So I find this absolutely fascinating. I am there for this. Um, first of all, because of who they grew up to be, but also just because as children, I'm really interested in not only women's history, but children's history. So this is giving you both. Um, and the fact that they were all together at the same court at the same time growing up, I think is fascinating. So um, I'm hoping to read that title as well when the time period for that comes up in Historathon. Um, so yeah, Young Queens and All She Carried. And then let's see. So that's it for the Women's Prize for Nonfiction. Now, um, for the Irish Readathon, I am a bit stumped, but I do have one. It just came in at the library today, so I have not had a chance to pick it up yet, but it is another graphic novel, and it is called Daughter of Her Father's Eyes by Mary M. Talbot. Um, so summary. 
part personal history, part biography, daughter of her father's eyes contrasts two coming-of-age narratives, that of Lucia, the daughter of James Joyce, and that of author Mary Talbot, daughter of the eminent Joycean scholar James Atherton. And um, I think it's, I, I'll look up the pronunciation, I don't know if it's Lucia or Lucia, uh, but um, James Joyce was her father, and unfortunately, I believe at the age maybe of 27 or 30, she was committed to a mental hospital. And she had been a dancer, she was very beautiful, and um, she was a friend of the playwright and poet Samuel Beckett. So this is the story of her life told in the form of a graphic novel. And so I'm very, very much interested in learning more about her life because I'm interested in disability history and because I think James Joyce is just so lauded and, you know, um, praised and put on thrones uh, in the world of literature and, uh, you know, deservedly so, but I think this is a chance to raise up the voice of a woman who lived in his shadow. And so I'm really excited to get that from the library and read that for Irish Readathon. I can't um, come up with any Irish middle grade books. So if you have any recommendations for middle grade books, which also happen to be either set in Ireland or by Irish authors, I would really appreciate some suggestions down in the comments. Um, so there's that. And then for mid grade March in general, I do have two that I'm interested in. And they are um, Little House on the Prairie, because I'm continuing with my Little House read-along. And then additionally, I, out of storage, got my copy of The Door in the Wall by Marguerite D'Angeli, which I have not read in years and years and really don't remember. So I'm very excited to take a look at this one again. And, um, one of the things I am doing is um, I am, I've decided to read not only winners and runner-ups for the Pulitzer Prize, but also for the Newbery Medal. And um, I might do a, a whole vlog just on my little binder here on my organization system, but in this plain white unassuming binder. I have lots of different lists. Um, I have all of my girl sleuth lists for all the sleuths that I read. I have like Nancy Drew and I check off and I've got all the um, Agatha Christie's divided into Miss Marples and Poirot's and standalones. Um, what else? I have uh, the Bailey Gifford Prize and the Wainwright Prize for nature writing. I have all the backlist for that. And another list that I've printed out is the Newbery Award. So I'm slowly going through and collecting, and you know, I've also got a lot of um, them on my vintage shelf, but I'm getting any that I don't have. And also some of the finalists, um, which people don't read as often as the winners. Um, but in any event, so the door in the wall is definitely on that list. So I am looking forward to that and many others this coming year. And then, um, you know, if there are any others, though, I would be excited to read those as well, especially if they are also set in Ireland or by Irish authors. Um, let's see. Book Voyage. Um, yeah, I think The Fox Wife um, counts really well for that challenge because I have not read any other books that were set in Manchuria. So um, yeah, so that really fulfills that guideline. And then March Mystery Madness. Um, so I've already read 
um, the Mary Stewart book, which I guess you could count. It's more like romantic suspense, but there is a mystery. Um, and then I'm going to read one of the following books and maybe you can help me choose one. So, you know I love my Mrs. Polifax, and so I've got the second one in the Mrs. Polifax series. I did a review of the first one um, several months ago or last year and loved it. Um, and this is the second one. My mother had stacks of these on her nightstand, and I remember growing up with the hardcover editions of these, but I like these paperback editions with this art. She looks so hip there. Um, so this is the amazing Mrs. Paula Fax. And in this one, she goes to the countryside of inner Turkey. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I think it's probably going to be this one that I choose, but we'll see. We'll see what I have time for. Um, and then the other two I was thinking of, um, I read the first couple of Patricia Wentworth novels. And the second one, uh, well, actually this is number five, is The Chinese Shawl. And that was the one I wanted to read next. And Lil of Lil's Vintage World says this is marvelous. Um, it's rated very highly. So um, Tannis Lyle was one of those passionate women who always got their own way. Her cousin Laura hated her. Most women did, but men found her irresistible and she used them mercilessly. So when Tannis was found murdered, there seemed to be any number of suspects on hand, but Miss Silver had her own suspicions. So this sounds really good and cozy and uh, love the colors, love the illustration on this. Um, so that's a possibility. The other possibility, I've had this for months and I had meant to read it last autumn and never got to it. This is from the British Library Crime Classics editions and that is The Wheel Spins by Ethel Lena White and that novel served the basis for Alfred Hitchcock's The Lady Vanishes. Look at another wonderful travel poster here. So, um, you know, mystery, femme fatales, trains, um, and Iris Carr um, is not really a femme fatale, I shouldn't say that, but, um, you know, she's, it reminds me actually quite a bit of Agatha Christie's The Blue Train, is that the name of it? Mystery of the Blue Train. Um, but in any event, this was published in 1936. This would also be a wonderful, cozy book to read. So you tell me which of these two you think I should start with. I'm going to read them both, of course, eventually, but um, yeah, so let me see. Have I missed anything? I think I've covered it. Oh no, there is one more. Um, and this is just for fun. Um, I've been reading plays. You know I love short form literature and I often talk about short stories, poems, essays, plays, and things like that on my channel and encourage all of you to do that as well. So I'm also at the library. I have reserved a copy of The Women by Claire Booth. Claire. I have also reserved a copy at the library of The Women by Claire Booth Luce. The Women is a 1936 American play, a comedy of manners. It's a commentary on the pampered lives and power struggles of various wealthy Manhattan socialites and up-and-coming women and the gossip that propels and damages their relationships. Now down in my basement, I also have a DVD of the film version of this. There were two film versions, but my version is from 1939. It was directed by George Cukor, and it's based on the play. It was adapted for the screen by Anita Luce, who I think also did the, the, the uh, screenplay for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes? Maybe, maybe. Um, 
And the film stars Norma Shearer, Joan Crawford, Rosalind Russell, Paulette Godard, Joan Fontaine, um, lots of people. And there was a later adaptation that was also done as a movie in 2008, but I don't know anything about that one. Um, but I may have to dig that DVD out and watch that. Um, and this was a very popular play about women's lives at the time on Broadway. And so um, really looking forward to the women just as kind of like a light, uh, shorter work. Um, it's supposed to be very good. So yeah. So I've covered a lot and I haven't even talked about all the plans or all the pile of possibilities, but um, that's the majority of them. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Give me some suggestions for some others I should check out. What challenges are you participating in this month? Are you reading anything for Women's History Month? Uh, are you doing the Fierce Challenge? Are you doing uh, March Mystery Madness, Middle Grade March? Um, you know, let's just chat it up. So um, it's great to be back with you today and I will see you again real soon. Bye-bye.